anyone knows about what preemptive multitasking is and cooperative multitasking. Um, but to give you a, a brief history, I, when, I, when I first started programming, it was uh, quite a few years ago. Um, and that was on um, a BBC, which obviously totally different. And then uh, went on to um, work on an, an Archimedes, I was lucky enough. And also at college, I was uh, using a Windows PC. At the time, they were running, it was running Windows, I forgot the version, it was it predated Windows 3.1. So whatever version, uh, whatever version that was, it was pretty horrendous. Um, but then um, Windows XP came out and also OS2. Um, and one of the things that they pushed there was preemptive multitasking. Um, there were machines like the Amiga, which had preemptive multitasking to start with, and Visco OS uh, was cooperative. Now, the, the main difference is if you're running a cooperative multitasking system, um, if you're accessing a floppy disk or something like that, you would notice the whole machine would stall, and it was kind of irritating at the time. Um, whereas on uh, machines like uh, the Amiga, the floppy disk access would not slow the machine down at all, which made things um, much more fluid. Um, now, as, as time moved on, obviously we've moved away from floppy disks and such like. So the, um, the issue of preemptive multitasking is less of an issue, but there's a lot of people um, on, certainly on the risk OS forums, who have been, um, uh, not just the risk OS forums, but the, the Raspberry Pi forums, thinking that risk OS is quite, quite being cooperative multitasking. Um, now, personally, I'm quite a fan of it. Maybe I'm a bit of a masochist, that's, that's probably true, but um, the benefits of uh, preemptive multitasking is um, the operating system actually controls the amount of time that an application will get. So if you have um, an intensive application, it won't just eat into all of the CPU. Um, so it does um, effectively automatic time slicing, whereas on Risk OS you would have to say, your application says, right, I need to do some work, and the OS, well the OS would give the application some time, you would do, you'd do some work, and then at the end of it, you would then say, right, I finished, you can have control again. Um, with preemptive multitasking, what happens is the OS decides um, which application will get um, uh, time on the CPU, and then after a, after a predefined time, whatever that is, um, the CPU, the operating system will then take control back off um, off the application. So the application doesn't really have much control over how much time it can take. Um, the, main, the main disadvantage for this is on, on uh, uh, less powerful CPUs, especially, I mean, the ARM is a good example. Whereas if you want to do um, quite intensive processing and you need real-time access, um, uh, preemptive multitasking operating systems that do real time are very few and far between. I think VAX, VMS are probably uh, one of the few ones that can actually do it. Um, so nowadays is not so much of a problem because of the machines are much faster now. Um, I mean, machine at home is quite cool, three gigahertz. So I mean, it's, it's very quick. So the real time doesn't come into much of a problem. Um, but overall, um, preemption, preemptive multitasking means the operating system feels smoother, um, but it doesn't actually make the OS any faster. Um, in fact, it possibly makes the OS a little bit slower um, because every time, every time an application needs to, well, every time an application gets control of the system. There's a lot of um, moving around of memory called context switching, which has to take place. So it has to juggle all the all the memory around and say, right, this is where you were before. Right, 
OK, go. And then when it finishes, it has to go to the next application and say, right, what state, what state was the memory in before? Right, I'll reorganise it and put it in there. To say, with, with modern CPUs, the amount it doesn't notice, you don't really notice. Um, but one of the things people always um, seem to forget is, I don't know, well, you probably all run Windows at home. Um, unfortunately. Um, um, so if I do a Google search for um, this will probably pick up quite a few hits. Maybe. <laughs> it seems to have uh, oh there we go. So you probably come across uh, Outlook is not responding or whatever. So you've um, one of the things that people um, assume is that um, preemptive multitasking will solve this this classic problem where you've got an application and it just says um, it's not responding. I don't know if you can see. That one, which is a kind of one that uh, plagues me for ever and ever, is uh, Microsoft Outlook is not responding. Um, although the, the operating system itself is still fully responsive, the um, application itself is, has, still has the same problems as a cooperative multitasking system. So you still, you, your applications are still going to lock up. Um, and one of the things that Risk OS, by being cooperative all the way through, is it does tend to drive it does tend to drive programmers to um, not very rarely have this kind of problem because if your program stops responding, it's not just your program that stops responding; it's your whole operating system. Um, the flip side of that is it makes programming on under Risk OS a, a lot more complicated because you have to think things through a little bit more. Um, So the, I mean, the uh, the main reason for programs locking up will classically be down to um, I/O response. What I mean by that will be uh, disk disk I/O. So you're trying to read or write something to disk, like we were saying earlier about writing to floppy disks, where you do that and the whole the whole machine would just go <laughs> uh, while it wrote, um, or downloading. Um, downloading off the internet or whatever, because obviously that's far slower than reading or writing to say a RAM disk or something like that, which is fairly uh, fairly instant. Um, so if, if you have a problem, um, say with Outlook, it could be um, that the server at the other end is either slow or uh, it could be that the server's crashed. Um, Quite often get that with Windows with network shares where it absolutely manages to hang the whole most of the most of the operating system just because there's, the network's got a problem, which is another another issue. But um, just hang on. So what um, what 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 the programs tend to classically do is they've um, they spawn new processes to um, to deal with the requests. So rather than just having one program running, you might actually have six or seven running underneath. So have your main program running, and then you fire off another one just to say, well, go and download this for me. Um, and obviously that's extremely wasteful. So that's where the, um, I forget when it was, but they, they came up with the idea of a thread, a lightweight, a lightweight uh, process. So it suffers less of the issues of um, if you had, say, 10 of them running, um, you don't have to swap out a huge amount of memory and then move them around. These are very small processes, but it's, it's, uh, it's more of a fudge than uh, anything else um, for a lot of things. Um, so things like writing... Um, writing to disk, floppy disk, modem or tape, 
um, they can't be resolved by either threads or preemption. So it's um, it's a bit of a false economy. The main um, the main benefits that um, other operating systems have um, is the it's, it's called the I/O scheduler, which is a lot cleverer. So if you want to write something to disk or floppy disk. Um, the operating system will um, take the data that you want to write and it will use, uh, generally it will use a large cache. Um, so it writes the cache first and then the scheduler will then, depending on the algorithms, there are, there are quite a varied number of them, but it, say it might use deadline, so it waits for a period of time before it actually writes to the disk. So yeah. So you, rather than just saying writing a small file, it will wait until those small files build up and then it can write one concurrent block, which again it appears, it appears to um, speed up things, but it's not actually speeding things up. Um, it's just making them more efficient, which if you have a lot of things running, does make things um, uh, actually quicker. Um, the, one of the other one of the other tricks that's used is um, is called um, DMA. I don't know whether anyone's come across that, which is di direct memory access. Um, I believe the Ionix uses it on the, for the hard disks, which is, is quite a nice benefit. So largely, what that does is, if you want to if you want to write something to um, to disk or read it from disk, rather than rather than saying right, okay, I need to read this data. And then waiting, you can just you can say to the controller, um, "I want to read this information off the disk. This is an area of memory. Please go and do it." And then when it's finished, the controller will then send a signal and say, "I've finished the request now." And then your process can then come back and go, "Oh, I can carry on and do my work." Because that, that's sort of processor independent, isn't it? Really? It's just a yeah. effectively start at an end, like say, so mm. do the job before you finish, right? Yeah, because that's what uh, IRQs are used to call back onto the. It just sends a signal to the um, to the CPU directly, and then that will then tell the operating system. Because that used to be the thing they spent all the time on PCs having IRQ conflicts. Didn't they? Yeah. Once upon a time. So Risk OS um, or implement a lot of these mechanisms anyway. Um, less so much now with, um, unfortunately, with DMA. Um, ADFS has a rudimentary caching mechanism. It's not particularly, it's not particularly good, but it, it does the trick. But on the um, the later file systems such as SDFS, which is the um, file system for SD cards, um, that doesn't. I believe it doesn't have any caching at all. Um, so that's. The um, I believe the newer um, A15 uh, models, um, the AMAP5 that's being worked on at the moment. There's, there's kind of rumours that DMA will be uh, working with that, which is is good. Um, that should make a significant difference to risk OS. So it's sort of post big award and things like that. It's yeah, the it's, the, it's the it's yeah the um, the the panda board runs um, an A9, mm -hmm. and the um, which is the same as my phone, yeah. but the the latest phones, well not the latest, but the the, the current generation uh, run uh, on A15 processor, which is quite nippy, um, and that's uh, a work in progress at the moment. I believe there's two boards that are being worked on um, for the A15. So I'm saving my pennies at the moment to, uh, in preparation to having to shell out uh, a bit of cash, which I'm sure our company will be more than happy to uh, yeah. <laughs> let me part with. Yeah. So what's the actual name of the board on that one? Um, it's not Bagel Builder or anything like that? No, it's not. It's, um, it's just it, it's something. It's OMAP five eight something. Oh, right. So it's just a it's a, um, yeah. it's a development board. Right. Yeah. So the because now I get things from Farnells every so often. It's all different processes. They're all trying to take sort of like the high bigger boards. 
things away from us. Yeah, there's quite a lot of um, A15 boards, but I think with Risk OS they're trying to stay with the OMAF, which is yeah. Texas Instruments, yeah. um, to make life a little bit easier for porting. Um, Yes. Anyway, going, going back to one of the one of the problems I've I've found is with uh, cooperative multitasking, is if you're um, I don't know whether any how many people are familiar with my application News UK, um, but that um, I've tried to make that very fluid, so it loads without jamming the desktop up. It doesn't really work on a, on a very well on a wrist PC. Um, but that's largely due to, down to the, um, the image processing as well, um, because I use Change FSI to do the image processing, so it's quite heavy. So when it tries to do the image processing, the processor just. Um, but this, but the, the, one of the, the problems is with when you're doing uh, cooperative, is you have to um, slice everything up into bits. So it makes it a lot more difficult if you just want to say, I want to, I want to download these files, um, go and do it. You can't really do that because you might spend um, like 30, 30 seconds just downloading a file, um, which is going to annoy people quite a lot. If it's every five minutes on a refresh, then every 30 seconds you can't use your desktop at all. It's not really very good. Um, so my, my, my current project is to try and uh, write a library that will make that a lot easier to do. Um, so it's based on a, a module. So you can effectively just say, get me this file and tell me when it's finished. And it will just go away and do the whole thing seamlessly. So as far as, as, far as trying to work out how much time I've spent, uh, can I spend any more time, how much data should I read, how much data should I write, um, when should I um, when should I nest next nest the wimp to give me give me some processor time and all things like that? That will all be taken care of um, because it'll it will just send a signal back to the program and say, "I've downloaded this file for you. It's ready to be processed." Um, which, from, for the applications I actually want to carry on writing, um, it should make things a lot simpler. When you're switching in and out of a processor, what kind of a time scale we're talking? We're we talking milliseconds. Or yeah. Yeah. What for? What you mean for? If you were doing two or three processes at the same time, uh, how much time would each process claim? Um, <laughs> are we talking about cooperative, or are you talking about risk OS, or? <clears throat> Or on a both OS in, in general. Um, well, risk, with risk OS is cooperative, so it's whatever it's whatever you decide. Um, with um, with preemptive operating system, it's down to uh, it's it's down to something called a quantum. You define you define the maximum the maximum amount of time you can use, mm -hmm. and then the OS will just literally just say you've had enough time and just take it off you. Um, and the various exceptions to that depending on what you're doing. Um, if you're doing I/O or something like that, the operating system may decide you've spent too much time hogging, hogging, hogging that resource. I'm just going to boot you off anyway. Um, it, it can get fairly complicated because there's other other things that are involved, such as priorities. Um, for example, if you're if you're doing if you're doing sound, obviously you want uh, your sound needs to have higher priority because if you if you say streaming VoIP or something like that. If if you're receiving um, if you're receiving someone's voice and then all of a sudden the processor says ah well actually you're not going to get you're not going to get the uh, CPU again for another for the sake of being silly five seconds then you, you, your conversation is going to be very broken. Um, is that uh, where they come into quality of service markers and things like that? That's more that that's down to the networking side of things. That's yeah. Oh, quality of service. So that's another horrendous pain. That's, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, telephony is a, a minefield in itself. I'm glad I got involved in telephony. Um, so one of the one of the current issues with Risk OS at the moment with networking is the uh, resolver. 
Um, so if you want to go to a website, um, one of the first things it needs to do is look up an IP address. Um, and that can take any length of time, really. Normally it might take a, a millisecond or less, um, but there's no guarantee depending um, what's happening. For example, if you don't have a network, and it's going to take an awful long time to, to do it. So one of the problems is that it will just lock and just sit there and it will, it will take, um, I forget the time, but it's, it's quite a large amount of time, 10 seconds, before it will return and say, oh, it's timed out. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's something that needs, um, that I'm keen to try and fix for myself. Um, one of the things that it's good to know is um, if you look at downloading files using, for example, NetSurf. Um, it's quite inefficient in the way it works. Um, and this isn't a criticism of NetSurf, because NetSurf is a multi-platform browser. So it's designed to work on, um, I believe, Atari's. It's kind of strange. Um, Risk OS, um, Unix-based OS's, Linux, whatever. Um, so it uses um, a multi-platform library, which is um, CURL, um, for downloading. Um, and it uses, it uses uh, threads, I believe, to do that. Um, but one thing I noticed is if, you're, if you download using NetSurf, um, then about the maximum download speed I can get is about one, one megabyte a second. Um, however, if, I'm, if, I, if I do, if I want to download to test myself, I can get about six, six megabytes a second, um, and that's it. That's still slow. That's a specific problem with the Panda board. Um, there's no reason why you can't get much higher. But again, that problem is just down to the fact that it's not, it's not designed and tweaked for Risk OS. Um, so, um, the other thing to remember is now, Risk OS is obviously, since the days of the A3000, which was my first Archimedes, quite a few days, quite a few days ago. Um, when I first got it, I, had, I think it had one megabyte of RAM, um, and I managed to upgrade it to four megabytes of RAM, thanks to Watford Electronics. Um, but that's come quite a long way now. Uh, um, the Raspberry Pi has 512 megs um, on, the, on the B models, and the, uh, the Panda board has um, a gig of RAM, and the uh, the new A15 boards are two gigabytes of RAM, so there's a, a lot more RAM available, um, and it's quite a shame that that's not being utilised for cache, so on and so forth, which um, could vastly improve the speed of Risk OS um, and reduce the, the issues that we see on various things. Um, that's that was the kind of bit about preemption. I don't know whether anyone's got any. Uh, <coughs> Would like to say I'm wrong because I always like to, I always like people to say I'm wrong because I quite often am wrong and uh, it's good to hear other people's point of view. Um, I think largely my fault is that um, I'm quite quite a fan of Risk OS um, and I like the fact that it's cooperative because it makes you uh, think a little bit more about how you actually program and how you have to structure things. I know from um, doing programming on on Linux and other, um, other operating systems, you end up going through at least three cycles of, um, uh, of an application before you come up with a design that's actually workable. Um, with Risk OS, it's uh, a considerable pain that you have to go through to start with. It makes you think a little bit more, which in the end possibly makes it possibly a little bit faster to work once you get used to actually going through the methodology rather than just knocking things together. Um, the other thing with the, with the, new, the newer boards, um, not with the Raspberry Pi, um, but with the Panda board, um, I'm not sure about the Beagle board, but certainly with the newer ARM the new um, SOCs, the, the Panda board dual core, um, and the newer ones are going to be quad core. Um, <coughs> So there's an opportunity to use uh, multiple cores. Now, how that would pan out with RiskOS is, uh, is another 
is another matter. Um, other operating systems use um, uh, symmetric multiprocessing, which it, it basically allows you to run uh, multiple processes at actually the same time on different CPUs. Um, with RISC OS, I suspect that's probably not really viable. Um, but there are quite a lot of things under RISC OS that are um, highly intensive. Um, obviously, I'd be most interested in things like change FSI running on a separate processor. Um, and say if you had four processes, you'd be able to run, um, you'd be able to process three images at the same time. There'd obviously be memory overheads to that. Um, but offloading onto separate CPUs um, would be a great thing. I remember when I first came across the RISC PC and they had uh, the uh, second processor slot, yeah. and I was quite excited. I was thinking, oh, I can plug another ARM chip in there. <laughs> and then uh, the, the 486 processor came along, it's like, what's that for? Yeah. Um, and it and it never came it never came to fruition. Whether that was just purely me dreaming that. Uh... No, they did have a thing called the Hydra. And we missed out oh, on yeah. this one uh, just before the strong arm came out. Uh, I can't remember who it was. It came out with a board where you could put seven ten processors in. Simtech, Simtech. I think uh, there was one one sort of overseeing it all the other four working together with it. Mm. And of course the strong arm came out and was around about the same speed to where we up. <laughs> I think somebody was selling one recently. This was sort of like amusing with that here. But it didn't run risk cost. I don't I don't think risk cost really benefited though. Risk no. still only ran on one of the arms. Yes. The others were right. if you wanted to program, you yes. were programming house and you wanted to yeah. do other things with the other cars you could. Yeah. Because I was thinking like when uh, we were talking about dual processors that Yes, you could be doing something and effectively use it like uh, your DMA, except it's a whole process and say, can you go and do that by yourself? Tell us when you're finished. And depending on how you use a, a memory stack, if you reserve, particularly if you've got the two gig, you know, you've got a right mother's spare memory to play around with and just say, well, I'll hold that once and then tell us when you're finished. And that'd be, well, in my mind, the easy way to program I'm sure it's, it's more difficult than that. But it's, it's only a few calls as such, isn't it? How are you actually get them to work in reality? Yeah. <laughs> Different thing, but the, the idea is like, like I'm saying, fairly simple. Ask that one to do that, and tell me when it's finished. I'm sure there's a bit more to it than that. <laughs> but, uh, no, so that's kind of it. I don't know whether anyone's got any comments or. The, the only thing I would say with the um, cooperative multitasking is one, you're right, it makes you right. It makes you write the program so it won't crash because you'll bring down the whole computer. It mm. makes you write it so it's incredibly fast or as fast as you can go. Yeah. Because you know that until you give control back, nobody else gets to go. Mm. The other comment I would make is part of the problem with a lot of these systems is the operating system call. If I want to load a file from a floppy, I use OS file and I expect then it to come back with an answer, either file not found, some sort of error, or my file. There's no option for it to come back saying, I haven't finished yet, I haven't finished yet, I haven't finished yet. So you can go uh, call Wimpole to give control back. So the whole operating system is written along the lines of, you ask it to do something, and we'll only come back when there's a positive or negative outcome to that, not when we're still waiting. Uh -huh. So the, the, part of the problem is the operating system calls. It's just that you know, there's a, there's a yes or no answer that comes back, not a maybe. What do you just do maybe? <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's part of the problem. The other thing with both systems, whether you're running on a PC or the risk of stuff is, in reality, you load up Word or you load up Excel mm. or you load up Artworks, that's your only task that you're running. Yeah. You know, it's how much of this, is, do you, yes, you're right with background tasks, multiple threads of the same program, mm. but in, in actual fact, it's how many people really run more than one program. I, I there's, not, there's one mouse point and there's one mouse and there's one keyboard. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I always amuse myself at work. A number of people, you know, we run Windows, surprise, surprise, at work. And just have one window. Yeah. Because yeah, they can't have more than one. Most I said that. Do. Windows doesn't lead you into it. It's not that, it's the human yeah. brain. The human brain oh, yeah. can do one thing at once, so therefore, <laughs> that's what you do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, guess, I want to see everything and then, because I'm used to drag and drop, is, well, let's pull that down there. Yeah. You can see them going, what's he doing? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's it's just on Windows. You know? <laughs> if you were copying a, a file, a yeah. file, and then you copy another file, and then copy another file. So you've got three files copied at the same time. 
you can see how they grind oh, your yes. hull. Mm. Absolutely. And yeah. then one, yeah. when one file is yeah. finished, yeah. They, they shoot off again. That's you know? right, yeah. yeah. But that's, so, a, that's a function that your computer only has so many instructions because it's only got so many clocks. So if yeah. you suddenly ask it to do three times as much, oh, yeah. each thing is going to go at a third of the speed. There's nothing yeah. to do yeah. with the. You know, it's, it's, it's just that's the bottleneck. Is the, is, is the, is the well, again, the with, with issues like that, though, it's more to do with the I.O. scheduling than whether it's cooperative or preemptive. Mm. Um, and how and how that's actually handled, because uh, if you say if you copy one file, um, one large file over here to this hard disk, and one large file over to this hard disk, then one of the problems that Risk OS has at the moment is like going back to the floppy disk issue. Is there's no? It's like right, okay, I'm going to write some data. You can, everyone else can wait. Well, it needs a data bus. Mm. That's that. That's why DMA is so good. Yeah. That's what DMA does. Is it yes. relieves the data bus for the processor to carry on using. Yeah. yeah. So without that, yeah. everything stops. Yeah, while our data bus is yeah. But it's a, it's a generic problem, not just with yeah. with that as well. It's um, uh, as I say with with networking. It needs to be more. It, everything needs to be moved from synchronous to asynchronous. Um, and if that's if that change can be made, I think the I think the uh, the benefits of um, Multiprocessor and preemption is, is largely irrelevant, I think. Um, I mean, even nowadays with the PCs with the dual and quad core, Windows still only runs on one core. Mm. It, it doesn't, you know, and, and I read an interesting article probably a couple of years ago when these multi core processors started to come out because the problem for software people really is how do you compile something? that runs across multi-cores, yeah. you know, it's like, because obviously most people when they write code, or if, if you're getting down to writing very um, low level code, is low register, and then your very next instruction, you're doing something with that number, and then you're doing something else with it. Well, that's no good on multi-core, because all that's going to happen is it's, well, that's going to do the load, Oh, my instruction is on this one, but I need the figure that this one's got. You see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so it's like yeah. I'm waiting for you now. So yes. a lot of what they would do, they would intersperse the instructions such that it wasn't the next instruction was a if you like a few further down that didn't need those answers and it would they yeah. would do it that way. But even even nowadays they were saying that getting <coughs> compilers to compile programs that run on multiple cores is extremely difficult because you get this effect all the time of I need the answer that you're working on, yes. I need this, I need that. And the more cores you add, the more that propagation yes. delay yeah. actually yeah. gets. Yeah. So it's like what they tend to do, we, we, we do a lot of 3D CAD at work. So you've got, generally you've got, you can see Windows running on one core and SolidWorks running on another core. But then if, if you wanted to do any picture rendering, each rendering engine will be on a different core. You know, and that's the way they're done. Because, like you said, that would normally be you'd have the hourglass on, waiting for your teapot to be rendered. Yeah. That it can give that to us completely separate call, then, and, and, and but it takes a lot of a lot of effort. You're not just gonna. Oh, yeah. It's not just a case of adding more cores, and Windows will automatically no, no. use them. It doesn't. No. It's, I mean, it's not that easy. I'm interested in music. I know uh, when they first started introducing like quad cores, they said, "Well, how many programs that actually make any difference?" Yes. Yeah. The well, not, on most computers, them, yeah. the, the, the third and fourth cars are doing nothing. No, That's the no, truth of it. Yeah. No, they're not doing very much. It's, so it's only things like, you know, if they're saying, yeah, we want reverb with echo and flange, mm. off you go. Then yeah. that's you using all three of them properly. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I know original and audio, um, the way they used to do that, uh, I think uh, Risk PC did have DMA and I had. Uh, video desk which did video with chips mm. but with the DMA to get to the hard drive. Uh, but originally it just used to have, uh, well strangely, risk sharp processors mm. uh, doing all the hard work so your PC was effectively telling these chips to go off and do the stuff and then sort of putting it on the screen and sticking it through an audio output. Yeah. You know. <coughs> uh, so there were DSP farms was the terminology they were using for those. And it's only now that they have got to quad core processors and mm. Multiple, multiple ones. But even then, the, the big boys uh, was looking at some stuff, <coughs> mind boggling what they get up to. They have network computers to try and play a whole orchestra because they have something like, uh, I think it's, it's about three DVDs worth of samples, multi samples, maybe just a violin, <laughs> right? 
to then form part of an orchestra, then another computer does like the percussion, another one does the brass and what have you. So you end up with six core, core computers trying to play back what effectively is an orchestra. And then if they've got the budget, then go and re-record it with the orchestra. <laughs> so you can never have enough stuff, but you know, that's, that's what they've got up to on the audio side on PCs. I think it's the difference between desktop and server though, people kind of got, I mean, um, the server that I've just, well, I just put live uh, last night, which is why I'm a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit rough and ready. Um, it's, a, it's a virtual machine, but it, it, needs, um, it needs eight cores to run. Um, and that's because it does, um, it does a lot of image processing, it does web serving, and it's got an application server as well as fax processing, so there's quite a lot of being involved um, and all the processes have to run smoothly, so it's fairly complicated, but it needs, it needs all the processes. But when it comes to a desktop, um, I mean one of the most depressing things, I remember, I can't remember what it was, um, but when Firefox 0.1 came out um, and I was using um, Mozilla, and it was really, Mozilla was really slow. And I fired, got Firefox, fired it up, and it's like, wow, this is so quick. Um, and this morning I was, uh, I was doing sort of a brief write-up, um, and I had Firefox running, and it was running like an absolute dog. And all I, all I had was, I had open uh, a C uh, my content management system, and um, I was just playing music on the other, on the other tab. Now, when I, when I was worst, first running um, Firefox, I can't remember what machine it was, but it would be a single, it'd be a single call machine, um, and it was probably a gigahertz at most. And now I'm running three gigahertz, four calls, 12 gig of RAM, and Firefox is running like a dog. So it's like, well, things have really not gone forward at all. Um, but if you look with um, the, Windows 8, um, and certainly from the server side of things, we seem to have gone um, back to basics. If you look at, uh, we had Windows Vista with Aero and all these shiny, wonderful, lovely interfaces, um, saying, "Oh, look how modern it looks." And then if you look at, um, if you look at Windows 8, well, if you take, if you take this um, this title bar, Windows 8 is plainer than that. It's just you know, it's, I think you know the focus needs to be um, for desktops. You know, do what you should be doing, um, and don't try and look all flashy and annoy the um, the Jesus out of the out of the user. Just get on, get on, and do the task that you're supposed to be doing. Um, so it's a common problem, though. It's style over function. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But again, that's one of my major likes of Risk OS. Is it's. Uh, when I first came back to it, I thought this kind of looks dated, um, and then, and then uh, when I actually played with it for a bit, not very long, probably about half an hour, it was kind of like actually it's nice and usable. Um, you know, there's no, and the fact that it's on a on a Pi, Risk OS runs faster than my, well, I say my, my quad core beast at home. How is that? How is that possible? Yeah. It's you know the the Pi is, is the slowest of the slow uh, computers that you can get nowadays. Um, certainly, Raspbian runs quite slow, uh, well very slow. But uh, Risk OS is really quick. So it'd be nice to it'd be nice to see some under the hood changes um, and libraries to well to improve things significantly. I think it's part of what we're saying. Like PC, but effectively the OS didn't really change except you can have bigger hard drives and stuff like that and uh, marginal pretty fine. But basically when they designed it, they got it wrong. But when, when Risk OS was being, well no, when, when the Archimedes was being designed, the original project was, I think was a, for a preemptive operating system. Um, and there were two camps designing it. There was a, a, a company in America they were doing the preemptive design, and then there was this dodgy company in the UK, as it were, um, who came out with Arthur, yes. who basically just um, sort of
kind of saw what the the, uh, the other side were doing and thought, well, we can do that and we can kind of get it working. Um, but we can get it working in two months, whereas the other side were kind of lagging. Yeah. And I think that's a testament to you know it's uh, and a testament to how arm was arm was created and the reason why it was created. And, um, you know, there's, there's no way that anyone could design a chip like ARM nowadays. It was just not possible. Um, and Acorn did it with no money, no time, no resources. You know, it's like, look, you've got to get this done. You've got six months to get it done. It's like, what? So. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Right, well, thank you very much for that. And if you can show your appreciation, there's no one. What they would do, they would intersperse the instructions such that it wasn't the next instruction was a if you're like a few further down that didn't need those answers and it would, they yeah. would do it that way. But even, even nowadays, they were saying that <coughs> getting compilers to compile programs that run multiple cores is extremely difficult because you get this effect all the time of, I need the answer that you're working on, I yes. need this, I need that. And the more cores you add, the more that propagation yes. delay yeah. actually yeah. gets. Yeah. So it's like what they tend to do, I mean, we, we do a lot of 3D CAD at work, so you've got, generally you've got, you can see Windows running on one core, or SolidWorks running on another core, but then if you wanted to do any picture rendering, its rendering engine will be on a different core. Yes. You know, and that's the way they're done. Because like you said, that would normally be, you'd have the hourglass on, waiting for your tin pot to be rendered. Yeah. That, it can give that to a completely separate core then. And, 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 but it takes a lot of, a lot of effort. You're not just gonna, it's not just a case of adding more cores and windows will automatically. Yeah. You it doesn't. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not that easy. I'm interested in music. I know uh, when they first started introducing like quad chords, they said, "Well, how many programs that actually make any difference?" Yes. And the answer is well, not, not, most computers. Yeah, the, the, the third and fourth cars are doing nothing. No, that's the no, truth no, of it. Yeah, no, they're not doing no, very much. It's, so it's only things like you know, if they're saying, "Yeah, we want river with echo and flange, mm. off you go," then yeah. that's you using all three of them properly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know original and audio, um, the way they used to do that, uh, I think uh, Risk PC did have DMA and I had uh, a video desk which did video with chips mm. but with the DMA to get to the hard drive. Uh, but originally they just used to have, uh, well strangely, Risk Shark processors mm. uh, doing all the hard work so your PC was effectively telling these chips to go off and do the stuff and then sort of putting it on the screen and sticking yeah. it through an audio output. Yeah. You know. uh, so there were DSP farms was the terminology they were using for those. And it's only now that they've got to quad core processors and you know, multiple, multiple ones. But even then, the, the big boys uh, was looking at some stuff mind-boggling what they get up to. They have network computers to try and play a whole orchestra because they have something like, uh, I think it's, it's about three DVDs worth of samples, multi-sampled, maybe just a violin, <laughs> right? To then form part of an orchestra. Then another computer does like the percussion, another one does the brass and what have you. So you end up with six core core computers trying to play back what effectively is an orchestra. And then if they've got the budget, then go and re-record it with the orchestra. <laughs> so you can never have enough stuff, but you know, that's, that's what they've got up to on the audio side of it. I think it's the difference between desktop and server though, people kind of got, I mean, um, the server that I've just, well, I just put live uh, last night, which is why I'm a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit rough and ready. Um, it's, a, it's a virtual machine, but it, it needs, um, it needs eight cores to run. Um, and that's because it does, um, it does a lot of image processing, it does web serving, and it's got an application server as well as fact processing. So there's quite a lot of being involved um, and all the processes have to run smoothly. So it's fairly complicated, but it needs, it needs all the processes. But when it comes to a desktop, um, I mean, one of the most depressing things, I remember, I can't remember when it was, um, but when Firefox 0.1 came out um, and I was using um, Mozilla, and it was really, Mozilla was really slow. And I got Firefox 
fired it up. It's like, wow, this is so quick. Um, and this morning I was uh, I was doing sort of a brief write up, um, and I had Firefox running, and it was running like an absolute dog. And all the, all I had was I had open uh, a C uh, my content management system, and um, I was just playing music on the other on the other tab. Yeah. Now. When I when I was worst, first running um, Firefox, I can't remember what machine it was, but it would be a single it'd be a single core machine, um, and it was probably a gigahertz at most. And now I'm running three gigahertz, four cores, twelve gig of RAM, and Firefox is running like a dog. So it's like, well, things have really not gone forward at all. Um, but if you look with um, the Windows 8, um, and certainly from the server side of things, we seem to have gone um, back to basics. If you look at, uh, we had Windows Vista with Aero and all these shiny, wonderful, lovely interfaces, um, and saying, "Oh, look how modern it looks." And then if you look at, um, if you look at Windows 8, well, if you take, if you take this um, this title bar, Windows 8 is plainer than that. It's just you know, it's, I think you know the focus needs to be um, for desktops. You know, do what you should be doing, um, and don't try and look all flashy and annoy the um, bejesus out of the out of the user. Just get on, get on, and do the tasks that you're supposed to be doing. Um, so it's a common problem, though. It's style over function. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But again, that's one of my major likes of Risk OS. Is it's. Uh, Rock. Helping you with Acorn and Riscos computing.